We're going to take a look today at the gravity flyer. I'm going to go through all the testing that I've done to this date on this machine. I'm going to tell you exactly what I was thinking at the time, what I think now about it, and exactly where we go from here. There is a lot of testing that was done on this. I spent countless years working on this thing, and I found out so many things about it. It's so much more than you ever thought it was. Let's go ahead and get into it. Let's figure out exactly what it was, and let's bring you through the exact process I used to get to the very understanding that I'm at today. The whole mystery of the gravity flyer starts right here. How did Alexi get this thing to lift off the ground? Is it anti-gravity? It's up to us to reverse engineer it to find out. I built my first gravity flyer. I used vacuum motors in order to build this thing. And they're DC. I put high voltage into it. Now at first I just used a ballast with a dimmer switch in order to put the high voltage on the disc. I didn't have any Tesla coil to connect to it or anything like that. So I was just doing work on the actual high voltage on this. I got it up and spinning as you can see here. It looked pretty good, but it wasn't exactly what I wanted to do. So I decided to build a new model. What I tried to do was just scrap the original design in part and just build my own. I put bars over the top instead of using all threads. I thought maybe I can reduce the weight of this craft. Maybe that would be the thing that got it to lift off the ground. My original gravity flyer weighed about 10 pounds. And with this newer version, I got the weight down to about 3 pounds. As you can see, it had an effect that it actually wobbled across the table. At 3 pounds, it's very light especially when you're running the RPMs of your motor right around 4,000 RPM. The black wires on the left are for the motors. The white wires on the right carry the high voltage. I used coax cable because it was really well insulated and it would transfer the power from the ZVS and the flyback directly to the disc. It left no leakage in the wire whatsoever. I also wanted to test if the magnets on the bottom were making a magnetic field. Anytime you rotate magnets, you get a magnetic field. So if you take your multimeter and put the probes out there and put them next to the magnets in rotation, you should get an electrical value. This is the test that I use to understand this. You rotate a neodymium magnet at 7000 RPM. You can then move the probe back and forth and calculate the exact magnetic value based on distance. It is only at a very high value at three quarters of an inch. And then it progressively gets worse the more distance you go from it. What I also learned in this is I actually didn't need the coil itself. All I needed was the actual probes and it would tell me exactly the amount it was. What I didn't realize at the time is that these magnets were in shells. So basically, when you put a shell around a magnet of steel, it'll block the magnet force from coming out the sides. So where was the magnet force directed? It was directed straight up at the center plate itself. One of the biggest misconceptions in this whole project is motor speed on your disc. How fast they go? Is it going to affect lift? Well, in adjusting them here individually, you can see that it's just creating vibration in the craft. That's all we're looking to do here. The bottom disc has magnets on it, so you're going to get centrifugal force. What does that mean? It, what it means is simply that it's going to hold something steady in one position and not allow it to move up or down. It'll create the force going out left and right. When you run this thing out of balance, as you can see here, it jumps all over the place. As you bring it more in balance, it calms down. So adjusting the actual center plate to have resonance in it is exactly what we're doing here. By adjusting the motor speeds, we can get a resonance value. In this one, I should have taken the opportunity to change the legs on it 
so it wouldn't have bounced around so much. But the test was very useful in understanding this concept. Rotational speed is not good when it's way too high. To understand this concept better, I took the bottom plate off of my gravity flyer. I rotated it at 3000 RPM. What would happen was, as you moved it around and set it in one place, it liked to stay there. It did not like to move up and down. When I cut the power, it was able to move up and down freely. When I turned the power back on, it would not like to move up and down. It would wiggle a little bit left and right, but it would generally stay right where it is. This was my first high voltage test. It was a complete failure. What would happen was is the high voltage would take the easiest way possible to make the voltage spark. That meant it went right into my motor. It also meant anything that was a bolt in there that was metal, it was attracted to. In order to correct all the problems with the voltage jumping over to the bolts, I removed all of the metal bolts. I then put plastic bolts in, right where the high voltage goes down to where my motors are. This solved the problem. It no longer arced over to the bolts. Now I was able to run some quality tests on the high voltage. So I took the center plate and I put the high voltage negative on it. I took the high voltage positive and put it on my upper plate. The result was a beautiful light show. You couldn't see it when the lights were on, so I had to turn the lights off. What I got was a tremendous plasma glow. The amount of ion wind that comes off of this is very low, 0.4 meters per second. This means that this craft has zero chance of running on ion wind. So the question is, why was it so low? The center plate itself was absorbing all of the ions that were put off in this field. One important note on this is that every time that it sparked over, it would stop the ion flow. That means it would reduce the amount that it was putting directly into the center plate. To fix this problem of sparking over, I just moved the upper plate a little bit higher. The next logical question was, if it doesn't lift on the ion wind, then does it lift by the rotational force of the actual disc? Can we create enough wind in this to make it lift? So I put a fog machine to it and decided to find out if that's what it was. As the fog comes in, you can see that it absolutely has zero effect on it on the wind. We're not getting any wind push not between the center plate and the bottom, not between the top plate and the center plate. This thing was like it could sit in a still night and you'd never know it's there. There wasn't a whole lot of wind on this at all. Because this test was more about the wind than anything else, there was no high voltage connected to the plates. There was also no Tesla field connected to the center plate. Like many of you out there, I reached a point where I just decided that this machine was not going to work. And I set it aside for three months. And I decided the gravity flyer that I built here is my second version. Maybe it was flawed because I didn't follow the original design. So I decided to go back to Alexi's original design and replicate it the exact way he did it. So I can try this one more time. As you can see, this version looks a lot closer to exactly what Alexi had. I got the center plate to match exactly the same distance his had. Also, both top and bottom plates match the same. I also went to the original fan motors that he had on his device. All of it changes the exact way this machine operates. One of the things I realized right away was with these fan motors, 
the actual speeds that you get are nowhere near what I could get out of my BLDC motors. They actually only go up to about 12 to 1300 RPM on the upper one. And because the bottom has rotating magnets on it, the max that I could get was 600 RPM. This completely changes the thinking of exactly how this machine works. We all considered 3000 RPM or 2800 RPM to be the gold standard on how this craft works. The problem is the motors themselves cannot reach those RPM levels. Because these motors are so slow, you're going to have to rethink how you work on this craft. You're going to have to take the dial that's connected to both motors and crank it all the way to full. Then you're going to have to back it off. And what you're going to find is you're actually changing the resonance in the center plate. When you run motors way too fast, it changes the resonance frequency in the center plate. There's only one frequency that's going to match aluminum. There's only one frequency that's going to give you a higher value in everything you're going to look for in this craft. Is one of the biggest understandings that I took away from rebuilding this thing. And as we look at more experiments, it's going to prove more and more more crucial exactly why he used these motors. This is one of the first tests that I did when I remade my gravity flyer. I hooked in my high voltage here. As you can see, it's a single flyback with a ZVS. And the actual negative goes to the bottom disc. The positive goes to the top disc in this setup. And we have our Tesla coil come over here and it's run down the center of our Tesla coil. It is not connected. You see the wire hanging to the side? Not connected at all. This right here. This was a crucial part right here. Let me just explain this to everybody so we all understand this. When you run the wire down the Tesla coil, instead of actually connecting it to the wire, it changes the operation of the Tesla coil. Because we are working with a solid state Tesla coil, it does not operate in the same way that a spark gap Tesla coil works. So all your conventional thoughts of a Tesla coil on sparks, on the distances you get from it, all of it changes when you change to a solid state Tesla coil. So what does that mean here? It just means that different parts of the Tesla coil can operate at a different frequency than other parts when you shove a wire down the center of it. When you connect it directly, it'll all work the normal way a Tesla coil does. When you put the wire down the center, it changes it completely. It allows you to use different frequencies at different points in this Tesla coil. It's a mind-blowing experience, and it's one of those little de details that Alexi uses in his craft to change every operation in it. You can actually see the change in this. I'll play this one part again. When I move the actual fluorescent light up, it does not light up until it gets to the top four to six inches of this Tesla coil. The frequency is completely different in that area. Now that we understand what our Tesla coil is doing a little better, Let's understand it in this process. Our high voltage is connected to the upper and lower plate. Our Tesla coil is connected to the center plate. What happens is, as you turn up the Tesla coil in this, it'll actually start to create an interaction of the two voltages. And you start seeing it here. You see it start to spark. That's an important part of this whole thing. It leads to a much bigger understanding later. But at this point, it's just sparking over. It's creating the interaction between one voltage and the next, even though they're not connected together. Now that I knew there was an anomaly in my Tesla coil, I wanted to check the sound on the entire gravity flyer. I first checked the disc, then I went over to my Tesla coil and checked it. 
What I found was that same anomaly showed up in a different way. The same four to six inches in the top of my Tesla coil would appear to have no sound in it whatsoever. So I wanted to know a little bit more about why the actual Tesla coil wouldn't make a sound. So we had James from Tech Planet go ahead and take a look at the audio on this and let's see exactly what it was that was happening. But there is something interesting going on with your Tesla coil in the silent zone and it, it's, a, it's still producing sound at around 20 hertz. And it's actually producing quite a bit in that zone. Made it break down a little bit closer. This is your top plate. Nothing is really peaking too crazy. I noticed 120 hertz peak right there and maybe something at around 300. Um, and then it's something that, you know, there's a little bit of peak at 1000, but nothing really too crazy. I slowed it down here just in case you wanted to pause it and look what the frequency spectrum is. This one's your lower plate, and it has a similar sound pattern to your upper plate. Uh, this this uh, software is called Span. Um, it's a VST software, and I ran it in Reaper. Okay, so here is your Tesla coil. Now, this is your voice in the higher frequency ranges, but at 20 hertz, the lowest one right to the left here, is where something is going on. It's cutting out all the noise, but it's producing something at 20 hertz. It's peaking there. I would say maybe 18 to 20 hertz. So let's understand this a little better. I'm getting an oscillation frequency out of my Tesla coil. I'm also getting frequency out of my center plate. Because the discs are rotating, it's causing the center plate to actually resonate at a certain frequency. What happens when you get to the resonance frequency of the center plate itself? Well, it decides to put a frequency back into your Tesla coil. It's one of the biggest understandings of this device. It's one that controls many functions of it. What was the dominance resonance frequency? A dominant resonance frequency was actually 13 hertz. It took a long time to figure this out, probably about three months to actually understand exactly which frequencies was hitting where. I know we heard Tech Planet tell us it's about 18 at the lowest, but I don't think my microphone went down that low. What was the giveaway? My upper plate disc speed matched. 13 hertz or 780 rpm it was the exact understanding of that that's going to leave to so many more discoveries in this thing here my center plate was picking up a frequency in which the rotational speed of my upper disc was delivering to my center disc and then delivering back to my tesla coil changing the complete understanding of what Alexi was doing here. It was not just putting in the energy of the Tesla coil. 
he was changing frequencies in the Tesla coil by manipulating his upper disc. Now that we knew our Tesla coil was completely different than what we thought, maybe the high voltage was as well. So let's take a look at it. What I'm doing right now is I'm taking a static meter and I'm putting it over to each side. I'm checking the upper and I'm checking the lower plates. I'm also checking the center disc. What is so important about this entire part right here is that it's aluminum. You're taking a coil of high voltage that goes through a flyback coil, which has a, it basically takes a magnetic field and oscillates it back and forth in order to create the voltage to come out here. Now there's not a lot of amps in this when you do it. It's mostly volts. So what happens when you try to take something that's a magnet and put it up to aluminum? Well, the aluminum itself wants to reject anything that has a magnetic energy to it. It'll push it out and it'll start to make a field that goes around the disc. Instead of sitting on top of the disc, it wants to push away from it. And the more that you put into it as a voltage, you're going to get a field that expands further in rotation. When you don't rotate it, it'll completely change the entire project. So let's just verify this. Both motors are turned off. Let's, we have the high voltage turned on. We have the Tesla coil turned on. Let's see when we light up. And so we can see the high voltage lights up the light bulb. And the Tesla coil lights up the center plate. However, they're not that bright. We're not getting a whole lot out of them right now because the discs are not in rotation. So the fields are very, very small. We're not getting anything more than what the actual body of the machine will give you. Now let's put it into practice. We rotate the discs again. Now we're getting this thing to light up at the beat frequency of the disc itself. We have it a little further away. We know that we're pushing a field now when we're actually in rotation. And you can see the beat frequency. In this configuration with a high voltage on the top and bottom and the Tesla coil to the center plate, it puts out the beat frequency of the actual discs themselves. So each one is different and it's not aligning properly to the center plate. As you can see, it's really fast on the top. As you can see, it's really slow on the bottom. At this point, my field strength sucked. And we ran it with rotation, without rotation, and we still only pulled a few inches out from the actual craft. So what if I connected the actual gravity flyer directly to the Tesla coil on the number two coil? Well, this is the result. You can see the fluorescent light bulbs light up just fine. And we're getting a good distance out of it. We're actually going to get 35 inches of distance out of this configuration. What's the problem here? Well, we're completely overrunning our high voltage on the upper and lower disc. You can see it sparking over completely in a wild fashion. So it isn't a complete loss though. Although we know we can spark that over and the idea is to not spark it over, but we can still create a great distance. We just completely have to change what we're thinking in this. Because in this configuration, in order to add more power, we're ruining our experiment. So do we change the actual brush distance from the upper and lower disc? Or do we change the actual voltage and where it goes in? So I had a bright idea of inverting this thing. I'm going to now change this project around a little bit. 
in order to invert this, what we have to do is we have to take a wire from the top disc, from the brushes, all the way to our Tesla coil and down the throat of our Tesla coil, all the way down the number two coil, and then come back around to the bottom plate. It makes one big loop, never connecting to our Tesla coil, just going through the number two coil. Now, the center plate is connected to high voltage on the positive side. The negative of the high voltage is connected to nothing. So, what is it going to do for our project? It is now going to take a Tesla coil energy and it's going to throw it out. So now the top and bottom disc are producing a field in there that pushes out further. So let's see if we actually get some more distance out of this. As we can see, we made a huge improvement. We can actually pull this thing out quite a bit of distance before the light shuts off. Just so we understand how this works. Anytime you have your Tesla coil and you have your light and you're touching your light, you're actually absorbing some of the energy into your skin. Therefore, if it was sitting on a stand, it may give us a little bit more distance. However, with that in mind, we can still see that we're putting off a very good field now. We're now pushing out the field quite a bit. We inverted this project in order to see what the Tesla coil would do when in rotation. I guarantee you, most people have never understood what a Tesla coil does in rotation. They have never put one into it. They sit it on a shelf and they put a light next to it. Now we're taking the field of the Tesla coil and we're rotating it. It means that it creates something different. It creates something extraordinary. It's creating a field in it. This field actually pushes the high voltage out because we have the high voltage connected to the center plate. Now the Tesla field is in the upper plate and bottom plate. So what happens? As the Tesla coil field now pushes out, the high voltage itself pushes out with it. What does it create? It's a lot of EMI. It's creating a lot of electromagnetic interference because again, the flyback coil itself is just a coil of wire that actually has a magnetic field that pulses back and forth. So when it goes to the center plate, we get that same magnetic field, but we also get the voltage. The voltage is more like static volts. So because it doesn't have a lot of amps to hold it in, it's pushing out. The Tesla field is stronger than the high voltage field. Therefore, the Tesla field is pushing out that high voltage field and it's creating things that will make your computer go nuts in the room. And you can see we're getting a further distance out of our light here. It's an amazing concept. This right here is pushing fields out. We're creating an entire bubble around this thing at this point. We're getting it to go 360 degrees around it, except for the bottom. You see the bottom pushing out a ton of voltage. And it's for a certain reason. We don't have anything connected under there like we do the top. We can see the dome on the top. We put uh, aluminum tape on the top. On the bottom, it's not connected. It has a good three to four inch hole in the bottom where it's not getting any kind of metal touching each other. Not that it has a physical hole, but a hole in the amount of energy being pushed out. So therefore, it pushes energy down. This is part of Electric's original design. Why it has that, I'm not entirely sure right now. I do know that it's there, and I need to point out the fact that it's there. So, we now have a field that comes out. We now have something beautiful. This field is absolutely amazing. It is probably more beneficial than the entire gravity fire itself. And even if the thing will lift, it's more beneficial. This is what we were looking for in a UFO. Can we create a field around it? 
The answer now is yes. So one of the questions beyond how good this thing is, it doesn't work in reverse. When you hook this thing up conventionally and you put the high voltage on the upper and lower disc and you put the Tesla coil connected to the center plate, is it holding in all of that field from the high voltage coil? And the answer is yes. That's what the crazy thing is here. You know that it's creating a bubble when you can run this thing reverse. So, when you put the Tesla coil to the upper and bottom disc and the high voltage to the outside or to the center plate, you get the actual high voltage pushed out and it'll push for a great distance. I've had this thing pick up 10, 12 feet, no problem whatsoever. EMI will be spread out that far. However, when I run the Tesla coil to the center plate and I put the high voltage on the upper and lower disc, I do not get the EMI anywhere outside of this thing more than a few inches. What is that telling you? It's telling you that the test of the field that's going on is creating a bubble around the craft. Now, how do we change that and how do we see that a little better? I have other experiments here where I can show when you put the actual voltage on the inside, we can trip this thing up and make it go to the outside and push it out in the same configuration by now putting something in between to jump it to the outside of the field. However, there's something that's very important about this craft and I have to show it to you. Now that it's in this configuration, again, this is Tesla coil to the top and bottom disc and high voltage to the center plate. Let's look at what happens to the beat frequency of the entire craft. I turned off the light so that you can actually see the light bulb lighten up a little bit better. To me, it looks like a strobe light in my garage. To everybody else, it may look like there's little black dots. Just understand that it's strobing. So what's going on? I'm actually putting this thing over it and we're getting a beat frequency throughout the entire craft. Now, as you notice, it did not change whatsoever from top to bottom right there. So let's adjust the motor on the top and let's see if we can't get the beat frequency to change. We can see right there, I turned down the motor. You can see that it's slowed down the entire amount of strobing that's going on in that light. So, when we ramp it up, it should do the same thing. It's got to be one of the most interesting parts about this. The center plate itself is not changing anything in the high voltage, but it is picking up the beat frequency of the entire craft, not just the upper disc. Now the upper disc is controlling the upper disc false frequency, the lower disc false frequency, and the center plate. As you can see here, the motor is running really slow. Let's see if we can't pick up the speed and change it. And there it goes. A lot faster. Now let's check it all the way around and make sure. You can see it's strobing off a lot more. You're not seeing as many black dots. To me, when I'm watching it in its testing, it's like looking into a strobe light. It's completely insane. So as we can see, it didn't change from top to bottom. It's still the same, no matter where we put this thing. It's one of the most interesting parts about it. And I think in this configuration, we can really start to understand this craft a little better. The Tesla coil is changing based on our upper disc. It is changing the beat frequency of the entire craft. It is so important to understand that. It controls the actual Tesla coil instead of the Tesla coil controlling it. 
now that we're understanding this craft a lot better and I could actually see what was going on, I wanted to change this back to the original configuration. Let's put the high voltage on the upper disc and lower disc and let's take the center plate and change it back to the Tesla coil. But I wanted to find out. I said it, I did it before, so I wanted to show it. Can we take and hop a wire or hop a piece of paper or something and show that we can bypass that Tesla coil field? And in this experiment here, you're going to find out we can. How do you know? Well, the original time that I had this out there where we had it inverted, you would understand that I pushed the EMI out that messes with my computer. Now that I have it back in the normal configuration, I'm going to do the same thing, but I'm going to do it with a high voltage on the inside. And I'm still going to mess with my computer because I'm going to be able to pull that high voltage from the inside to the outside and force that Tesla coil to push that field out. Since they are in contact and they're going to like appear again, you hear it. Okay, let's turn down the high voltage a little bit. Get that stop sparking. Connect together. We're getting that static. As soon as it's off of there, it falls right off. Got it. As soon as it falls off. Huh. That's kind of neat to see. As soon as we get that spark over there, I have to set off my computer. Let's see if we can't get it up a bit higher. You can see voltage is going off. You can't hear my computer at all, right? Well, there it went. Let's see if we can make that computer go off a couple times. Doesn't like that high voltage. Anymore. What you may have also noticed is the actual voltage increasing. So what happens when you have these two fields interacting? It actually increases. Now here's the crazy thing for all you people out there. It's paper. It's not wire. It's paper. I'm taking a piece of paper and connecting two fields of energy with a piece of paper and it's changing the actual amount that the field goes. Why does paper do this? Paper is one of the very few things in this world that will do this. It's actually absorbing all of the static energy that's going on there. And it holds it in. A lot of people like to look at some of the inventions that are going on now when it comes to static volts. Please take this as a lesson in understanding. If you want it to work properly, use paper. Do not use styrofoam or anything else. It does not function in the same way. This is a very crucial experiment to understanding why paper does this. It polarizes this paper. When you looked at the old timers and when they first came up with static experiments, what did they use? They used paper. They were putting paper on the ground. They were putting static bolts around them. The paper would energize and go right up to their hand. It's one of the experiments that you should probably do in your lifetime to really understand this better. In our case, what did it do? It made the actual field on the inside push out to the outside. Just one last thought here on the paper before I move on to what the Gravito meter was reading. Let's understand this. When you're doing static volts, what you're going to look for is the dielectric itself. Has to be a dielectric 
but it also has to be semiconductive. However, it cannot be overly conductive where it shorts out the experiment. Anytime you take two different plates and energize them with two different fields and you put the paper in the center, the paper becomes a dielectric. However, it also becomes semiconductive. This is the reason you can apply force when using static electricity. Because both are in the same area as far as energy, but it's actually producing less in it, but it's also giving you the dielectric effect. The whole thing is a whole new way to look at static electricity. Let's get back to the Gravito meter though. As you can see, we have the Gravito meter here. I apologize up front. In this video, I actually blew out the green light bulb. And the red one is on its last leg, so you barely see it. What happened to do that? Well, what's going on here is the red light picks up the actual Tesla coil. And the green light picks up your high voltage coil. So, when you put this thing in and out, you can actually see where the fields are. What is Alexi doing with it? Well, he's aligning the fields. So when you have this thing going in, the fields are pushed out. They have to align properly. They have to get to a point where they're touching each other and they're interacting back and forth. If they do not do that, you will not produce the proper field. It requires that to put out a higher amount of energy. Now, does that strengthen the Tesla field? So far, I've found it hasn't. But what does it do? It's pushing the EMI out just a little bit out past the Tesla coil. Again, we saw the paper do it, and now we're seeing a dryer sheet do it. Again, it's the same thing, guys. It's pushing out that field just a little bit. So the interaction between the two fields is very important. We always see in Alexi's videos that he has both lights come on. If you don't have them both come on, you can't lift this thing. It's the field interaction. He's looking for the same thing. Does he have enough field built up inside? Remember, the Tesla coil is creating a bubble itself. So when it's connected to the center plate, it's connected to the whole craft. The whole craft is now holding in all of the high voltage field that's going on in the upper and lower plate. So as it holds it in, now you can understand in order for it to interact and pull out a little bit, you have to build that field. It takes time for that field to build. You have to take static electricity and interact it with the air around it. And you must now electrify that air inside that bubble. That's why the field is so important. You start to understand now did he really create a bubble for this thing to sit in? And the answer is yes. And is it electrified? Yes, it is. Is the actual air itself changing a little bit to more of an electric feel in the air? And it is. I've had times where I've walked in and this experiment's going on and the hair of my arms stand up, depending on which way you have this thing in which configuration. The static electricity in the air is very intense. So, as you can see, our red light's going off right there. Our Tesla field's showing that it's pushed out a little bit. Look, this is one of the key understanding of this entire craft. The fields on this are so important. If you don't produce them properly, you get no effect. It shows up later when we start to get into harmonics of this craft. Guys, I thought this when I started this whole thing. Just like the rest of you, I could throw some high voltage in this. I can spin the motors really fast. I can create some sparks on this thing, man. And we're just going to lift up into the air and be this gorgeous project and not be done within a week. And it just hasn't happened that way. What I'm learning in this whole thing is these charges moving around are so important. And... One thing I got to tell you in this, and hopefully you'll understand this, and it's not showing in this part of the video. If 
The Tesla coils connect to the top plate and the bottom plate. And the center plate itself is connected to the high voltage. It's going to give you a magnetosphere effect. And what do I mean by that? Because the high voltage has a magnetic field around it. The magnetic field is going to try to pull in anything into the center plate. The Tesla field, because it pushes things out based on the rotational speed, will want to push everything out. Anything outside the field will push out, but anything inside the field will be pulled in. You're actually going to be creating the same thing we have on Earth. We know that our magnetosphere pushes things out. We know that our gravity pulls things in. This craft itself is making its own gravity in its own way. It's probably not amplified enough right now to create its own gravity, but every signature that you've ever wanted is right there. It's pulling it in. The actual aluminum is not allowing the magnetic field to hold it, so it's pushing it out. The actual Tesla field is creating the bubble around it. It's pushing anything that comes out of it out. And then it's keeping whatever's in it in. Guys, this is a crazy understanding, but it's absolutely true in this craft. You can see by the experiments that it's actually doing it. Let's move on to a little bit of the testing on the harmonics. Some of the things that I'm doing in here, you'll see I'm going to start tapping the center plate. Uh, and what I'm trying to do there is change the octave in it. So the sound itself of the harmonics has to be in a different form when you go to do this. The clicking, annoying sound you're hearing is my piezo buzzer. I installed it upside down. So the actual center of the piezo goes down instead of it going up to the roof of the uh, device here. So that's what you're hearing, the clicking sound all the time. And my piezo buzzer going off. It's one of the first times I hooked it into my gravity flyer right here in the testing so that you guys can see it. It's quite annoying. I didn't figure it out to the very end. And you can see in this testing, the actual amount of vibration changes how much it's clicking. I guess in a way it's a good thing that I did it this way. So now you can evaluate it for what it is. So... Again, we're trying to change the octave of the harmonics when I tap the plate. And you'll see it changes the actual uh, vibration. Also, the clicking sound changes in this whole thing. And then I use the uh, dryer sheet as well to try to see uh, if I can't change the charge. So, kind of a lot to kind of look at in here. And each one individually in another area would have to be broken down. But it's just so you guys can see some different things in this and then kind of tell me what you're thinking on it. Just picked up a lot of energy as soon as I tapped that thing. Let me back down a little bit. So let me put a few numbers out there for everybody so you understand it. My Tesla coil is running at 40 volts. My piezo buzzer is running at 4 volts, 1.2 amps. 
and my high voltage is running at 12 volts. But I am adjusting the amount that I put into it little by little. So the less high voltage I put in there, the better. So I tune it down to right where it starts to spark and then I tune it right back to right under that and I just get the perfect mix in there. The actual craft itself, you can see it vibrating left and right. And it'll do that when you put the correct motor speed on the upper disc. The lower disc is set. You have to bring up the both disc at once because they're both tied in together all the way up. And then you bring down the thing until the upper disc gets right to the right RPMs and you'll start to hear this craft start to rumble a little bit. And then what actually starts to happen when the piezo buzzer is connected in there, it'll start to click. It's actually picking up all of the frequency that's going on in the resonance of your center plate and it's making that clicking or that popping sound. So how do I know I'm playing with the harmonics of this thing? We saw in some of the testing when I tapped it, the energy just all of a sudden picked up. You got a much higher volume of energy going on. Why? I actually hit the correct octave of this thing and it actually produces a higher amount of energy because resonance itself, when you resonate the correct material with the correct frequency, creates a higher energy out of it. I guess at this point there's a fair question to ask. Why isn't it lifting off? What are you missing? We see through all these tests you brought us all this far, what are you missing? I really think it comes down to two factors. One, the distance between the plates isn't right. I've played with it in several different configurations. Every time you see it, it's in a different one. And I haven't found the actual sweet spot that I want. The second is, I need to bring up how much voltage I can put in through my Tesla coil. I think I need to thicken that. The actual field is created need to be thickened. And there's a reason why I say that. And I'm going to show you one of Alexi's tests where he gets this thing to tip over. But it's because of where the light is on the Tesla coil. Remember when I tell you this earlier. When you have the light there, it takes away from the energy being put onto your gravity flyer itself. Remember that when I show you this test. This is one of Alexei's other crafts here. As you see, he's setting up his Gravito meter to read where the fields are. Guys, please understand this. He is sitting three feet from this craft. His fields are not sitting close to his craft. Please understand, he's setting it way far away from his craft. His fields must be huge. He's putting more energy in this than what he's actually telling you. So how else do I know that? You see that light bulb on his Tesla coil? Right now, that's pulling energy away from the craft. It's less energy that the craft is getting. In order to get this, you're going to have to create a field that absorbs the energy there and also produces it in your craft, but enough to make it lift. And you're also going to have to be able to put a field out far enough where you can take your Gravito meter and have it work three feet away from the craft. Now, it could just be that he's only checking the Tesla field. That's entirely possible. It could be that he's checking both fields. I find it very ironic that he does it, though. And you can see in here, he doesn't get this thing to actually lift. He'll actually get it to tip over, though. He is one step away from getting it to lift. Guys, it's a, it's a complete understanding of breaking down how somebody does something. You can always tell somebody what something is. I like to put out tests because they're raw, like this. It's tipping over. For those of you out there who think that's just a magnet, ma magnet rotating around really fast and tipping something over, I'm sorry. It is not possible. That thing weighs too much. That thing right there, probably what, 10 pounds at least, and it's pushing it over. 
You're only going to be able to do that if you create enough force under it. And I'm sorry, the magnets themselves do not have enough force when rotated to do that. So it's like I was trying to say earlier, the reason you put out your test and you show people what you're doing is so they can independently verify when they start doing their test and you tell them the correct figure configuration you're putting it in so they can verify it. When we look at this, I look at it the same way. If I'm going to go repeat this guy's experiment, I now have to verify everything he does at the distance that he does it in order to understand it. Can't get this thing to tip over with just rotating force of magnets. And here he goes. He's about to tip this thing over one more time. And it has to do with the actual energy he's producing in his field cutting off the gravity that's around him. And there it goes. He's got a ton more energy put in this thing than he wouldn't, wants to tell us. That's for sure. But it's only in the right places. And I think the biggest part of that energy is in that Tesla coil. I hope you guys learned as much from all of these experiments that I've done as I have creating them. This machine is far different than I thought it was in the beginning. It was a simple device in the beginning. Now it's become something much more. The fields that are created in this are going to go on forever throughout history, guys. This is going to be one of the things that everybody looks at when they try to create anti-gravity. You can create as much force as you want. It's still pushing against nature. It's only when you take nature out of the equation or you take the Earth's fields out of the equation that you create anti-gravity. That's why the fields are so important. I don't care which craft you want to build. I don't care if it's yours, Alexi's, you know what I mean, T.T. Brown, whatever. If you do not take gravity out of the equation, you'll fail. You'll just be producing more lift force. And that's what I'm trying to show here in some of this. I'm way more excited about the fields in this thing than anything else. But it comes down to understanding what you're doing. A lot of people get this thing, they spin it up and think, hey, it's not working. Why? Well, there's a lot more involved to understanding in this. Who knew there was resonance in there? Who knew the fields interacted? Who knew that the high voltage and the Tesla coil field interacted in the way they do? I mean, this stuff goes beyond just a simple learning or understanding. It's a whole complex problem. You just can't create gravity overnight. It doesn't happen that way. You have to take each step slowly. You have to verify everything. Go back and do the experiment. Do it one way, do it in reverse. See if it gives you the same answer. If it doesn't, then find out why. You have to be able to repeat your experiment. Every single experiment I've done here, I can repeat without question at any time, any place, anywhere. Guys, it's not even close. Everything works. I can walk over to your house. I can take my gravity flyer and I can build these fields out right in front of you without any problem. So please understand this. There's a full understanding here. I myself didn't understand everything that was going on in it. I still probably don't understand everything that's going on in it. One thing I do know, this man is hiding a little bit something from us. And it's not having coming down to a hoax or anything like that. He's hiding his secret of how he's doing it. And I think it has to do with that Tesla coil and the voltage he's putting out. He's creating a much bigger bubble than what we're thinking. I'm creating a bubble that's probably about this size right here. He's probably creating one that's way further, six feet at least. So it's probably the strength. It's like you see when you rotate a magnet there's fields that come into it. It creates a sphere of energy that comes around it. But then it comes out to different levels. It's higher intensity in the center. But if you don't have the rotational speed right, you won't even see that. You'll see the secondary field instead of the primary field in the center. That's why it's so important, guys, to do these tests. To try to match what he's doing. To see him doing it. 
it blows me away that we, for all of these times we look at this stuff, we don't realize how far away he is when he's taking these readings. Now you can say it's anything you want. I'm telling you, I hit the correct resonance frequency. I have this thing in the correct octave. Every bit of science backs that up. Every test that I do backs that up. I've created the fields. I can interact with the fields and where the distances are. Guys, this is truly an understanding of this craft. This is truly what I need to do to get to that next level. I'm going to double to triple my output on my Tesla coil. That's where I'm going from here. I need to have the power available to me to crank this thing up in order to get to where he's at now. I truly think the only way to block the gravity that's coming in is to take the Tesla coil field and push it that far out. Now, which configuration is he doing? In all honesty, is it correct in what he's saying in his actual diagram? Is he being truthful? Or did he leave something in there that you just didn't see yet? We don't know yet, but I can tell you in building these fields, I can push that testicle field so much further out when it's in rotation. Now, you can change the craft and say, well, let's just put a, a thing around it and let's rotate that and let's hook that up to our Tesla coil field, run it in the normal configuration, you can blow it out as much as you want. That would be fine, and I'm okay with that, but it's still not the same as his device have to recreate what he's doing so we're gonna play with it back and forth some more personally I like the field a thousand times better with the Tesla coil connected to the upper and bottom plates and the high voltage to the center it's more dangerous that way guys I've had a headache for four weeks it doesn't go away and I run this thing probably about five hours a day try to get some testing in and learn exactly what it's doing what you guys see on video it's probably just a small amount of that. But this thing actually puts off a microwave energy to it. And when you start pushing things out, electromagnetic microwave energy, it starts scrambling your brain. And I tell you what, it did it to me for four weeks. And it was only because I was within one foot of the actual gravity flyer when it went off. And it just blasted my brain. Now that my brain and the fog is gone, I see it very clearly, but it doesn't make me want to stop. I'm going to make this thing work, and I'm going to do it by amplifying that amount of the Tesla coil itself. We need to get that a bit, bit bigger. We need that to be a higher amount of energy so we can thicken that field. Now, that may just be both working in concert, but I'll tell you what, when you start to get that field out there, you're turning down your high voltage. It's mainly a polarizing field to get the whole thing to pull in. It's not so much of a field that's pushing out as much. That actual Tesla energy, the Tesla coil itself, pushes that field out. So if we put in more to it, I bet you we can thicken this thing. And we can get it right where we need it to be. Because if you do not thicken it, you cannot remove gravity out of the equation. Guys, I wish it was as simple as plugging in my toaster. I would have... A beautiful day and I'd be through this and on to my next project and I can get back to static electricity where I wanted to be you know a little bit earlier but I also know this I always wanted to create a magnetosphere and this right here could be the heart of it if it does it just right so I hope all you guys and all your adventures in building this have as much fun as I do doing this guys so Anyway, if you like what you saw today, please like, share, subscribe, do all those fun things, and have yourself a great day. Thank you.